Hello watch lovers, friends old and new, welcome back to the channel. My name is Stian and today we're going to look at a brand probably not a lot of people have heard of. It's called Bucher. It's a name that really lends itself quite exceptionally to being mispronounced. And adding to that confusion is that uh, it's not called Bucher nowadays. Now it's Carl F. Bucher. So uh, just be aware of that. If you're looking for these watches on Chrono24, for instance, uh, they will be under Carl F. Bucher nowadays. Anyway, it's a very simple watch in the sense that it only has three hands. It's a manual wind, no date, no complication, no nothing. But we see that it's not running. The dial looks to be in a very nice condition few small marks that you can pretty much only see very up close and the case looks pretty good as well uh, albeit quite dirty but that's something uh, we're used to we can see that it's uh, gold plated the back says uh, stainless steel back which is uh, a good indication that uh, the rest of the watch is not steel that it's uh, base metal that is uh, plated. It does have a pretty heavy plating. 20 microns is a uh, good standard. You will find a lot of old watches with a 10 micron and uh, they will be more worn. But you can see that the plating is uh, mostly good on this watch. So I said it's a brand maybe not a lot of people know about, but uh, it was worn or is worn in uh, the John Wick movies. And although uh, the modern Caliph Bucher watches are pretty expensive, uh, I don't think it would be a good idea to try to steal John Wick's watch. Anyway, we got the watch case back off. And uh, the balance doesn't really want to run. See, it uh, does kind of oscillate when I'm blown with a puffer, but uh, it's definitely not as it should be. And uh, we'll uh, see that in a lot of detail later. But suffice to say that uh, something is very off with this balance. Let's get the movement out of the case. And we can see that the dial is indeed in a very nice condition. It's a simple dial. Just says uh, the Bucher brand and uh, 17 joules. And that it does not say uh, Inca block, that uh, tells us that it's not from uh, the 50s. Because uh, at that point it would have said Inca block as a key selling point. So this watch is probably from uh, the 60s. Also judging from the overall design. So the movement is an Etta 2391. And this was a very common thing for Bucher watches back in the day. So uh, they did a big uh, repositioning of the brand uh, in the early 2000s. That's when they also uh, renamed to Carl F. Bucher and uh, they started uh, producing in-house movements. But back in 1888 uh, they started out selling watches and jewelry. And uh, that's actually their big business uh, still. They uh, are the biggest reseller of Rolex, for instance. have a big uh, Rolex store in a very prime location in Geneva. And they have their own brand stores in quite a few countries uh, across the world. And initially they simply branded uh, off-the-shelf movements, uh, had their own dials and sold that as their own watches in their own stores. And uh, yeah, this one is an example of that. Now. Let's uh, look at the big issue with this watch. This is uh, the hair spring on the balance there, and it should not look like that. It should be flat and uniform. So exactly what happened here, I do not know, but it's uh, not good. So let's see what we can do about that. 
The watch otherwise is uh, very simple, obviously, there are no complications. But we do see that even though we let the power down, uh, there's still quite some power left in the train. So that indicates uh, dirt. The movement itself is a sturdy movement, quite uh, thin. And it's a movement that you'll find in a lot of uh, vintage watches. We see it has a very nice uh, way of doing uh, the click. No screws involved there, just uh, lying underneath uh, the ratchet wheel. Reminiscent of how IWC has done it and uh, quite a few of their uh, hand wound movements. It's not a lot of wear in the movement either. See the barrel arbor is still uh, okay there. So uh, I noticed in uh, the comments section uh, someone talked about uh, these freaking dogs. Now what I was about to say is that uh, one guy mentioned in the comment section that his wife had been giving him uh, quite some heat for watching so many nerdy videos. And that's referring to uh, my videos. And uh, I do not at all take any umbrage with uh, being uh, called nerdy. <laughs> but just in case you need it, you can always say that you are watching uh, videos about uh, mechanics. About uh, big hulky men making parts out of steel and that kind of thing, right? I mean, it's not too far from the truth. Kind of. A little bit. All right, it's nerdy. Fine. We uh, have taken off everything on the train side, so now we're taking off uh, the motion works and uh, the keyless works. Everything very much straightforward in this movement. One thing of interest is uh, that it's a pretty early movement with an indirectly driven uh, minute wheel. Meaning that there's no center wheel that uh, has an extended arbor onto which you would press the cannon pinion. Instead you have an off-center second wheel, driven uh, directly by the barrel. That one then interacts with uh, the third wheel, which extends over to the dial side of uh, the watch, where it uh, drives the cannon pinion wheel. That's a very common way of doing it nowadays, but uh, not so much in the old days. And it does contribute to a slimmer movement. Now the last thing before we start uh, really addressing the big issue with this watch is that we need to uh, take out uh, the mainspring and the barrel arbor. We want to make sure we don't uh, bend the hairspring when we take it out. It doesn't take that much for a hairspring to be uh, bent. The easiest way to see it is that it doesn't lie flat on your bench. But this one looks okay, so we're uh, gonna reuse it. I'm gonna do some uh, pre-cleaning of uh, these uh, parts to get uh, some old gunk out of the barrel. Now, time to look at the big uh, problem with this watch, the hairspring. So we're going to first uh, take uh, the balance off the cock. We do that by unscrewing the stud and then uh, twisting uh, the boot for the index uh, to the side. Then the hairspring should come free. And that's not how it's supposed to look. I honestly do not know what happened here. Could be that someone uh, opened the watch and uh, either stabbed uh, the hairspring with a screwdriver or tried to pull the balance out uh, some obscure way. I've never seen it quite this bad. Let me just say right away that uh, the best thing to do if you have a messed up hairspring like this is uh, probably just to buy a new balance complete. Part 721. 
a balance complete is exactly what it sounds like. It's the balance complete. So that means that it has the hairspring attached to it. It has uh, the roller, the impulse pin and so forth. And the reason you want to do that is first of all, it's a really bad idea trying to buy a hairspring only because a hairspring needs to be uh, vibrated to be fit to the balance. Because as you might imagine, uh, the hairspring comes in uh, different uh, thicknesses, different strengths. Uh, the balance comes in different weights, different diameters, and all these things need to fit together. If that's not possible, then there's a relatively simple rule for how you manipulate the hairspring. You basically uh, find where the difference is biggest in the curves. And then you go 90 degrees back towards the center multiplied by the number of planes the error is in. So what that means is that uh, if uh, the problem is just that uh, two coils are a little bit too close or too far away from each other, uh, you just uh, go 90 degrees and manipulate uh, the hairspring at that point. But if the hairspring is also in a different plane, as we saw this one clearly was, then you go 90 degrees times 2, so 180, on the opposite side of uh, where the height distance is, uh, the max between the two planes. Sounds easy. Isn't always easy. And this one is so messed up that it's never going to be perfect. We uh, should be able to make uh, the watch run okay again, but... Uh, as mentioned, it's uh, probably the better option to just get a balance complete uh, for this kind of uh, issue. And after uh, this manipulation, uh, we're left with a hairspring that is uh, flat. Uh, you can see that uh, those places where it was bent so badly, we're never ever going to be able to get the hairspring perfectly uh, straight in those uh, spots. But uh, it should work, and that's the most important thing. So with that, we can put uh, the hairspring back on the balance. We're going to use our staking tool for that. We find uh, the hole where uh, the balance uh, roller fits uh, pretty much perfectly in. That way that we know that uh, we can center any type of uh, tool we put into the punch. And then we find the biggest sledgehammer ever invented by humankind. Or no, we just basically press the hairspring on. All right. Then we can put uh, the balance back on the cock and ultimately back on uh, the main plate so that we can uh, clean everything. Note that uh, we have not uh, checked uh, whether or not the balance is in beat. That's something we'll have to do later. Right now, we just uh, want to get everything cleaned and then we'll uh, take it from there. And with the last shock setting taken out, we are ready for the cleaner. Not a lot of parts in this movement. Hey, why are you saying that like that's a bad thing? Alright, so with the movement on the boil, let's uh, turn our attention to uh, the case. We're uh, going to replace the crystal. It's uh, standard crystal anyway, so uh, let's just press it out. It has a tension ring. 
That's this uh, golden uh, ring inside it. The case is in uh, fine condition. We're not really going to do too much about it. And uh, I do know that there are people who would like uh, me to do more about some of these cases. And don't worry, there will be future videos where I'm going to do a lot about uh, some of the cases. But I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some of the complexities uh, when working with old cases like this one. One uh, aspect uh, that I mentioned before is that uh, you want to have a watch that looks uh, coherent. You don't want uh, a mint dial and uh, a scruffy case or the other way around. You want them to look uh, like they belong to each other. The second uh, aspect is about the material of the case. If the case is uh, solid material, you can uh, refinish it uh, quite uh, easily in most cases. But uh, if it's a plated case, and gold plated most commonly, like uh, this one, then that's a bit of a more complex matter. And there are two reasons for that. The first is that uh, if you want to replate to the same thickness as the original plating, so 20 microns in this case, that's going to be very difficult and very expensive. And the second is that replating might not uh, give you the exact same color. So all of a sudden your hands and your indices and so forth are a different color than the case. So that makes it more complex. Anyway, let's get uh, these parts into the ultrasonic. All right, we have the case back from uh, the ultrasonic. It looks a lot cleaner. Let's uh, give it a quick uh, buff. And in the meantime, our cleaning machine has uh, finished doing its job. So we can uh, start uh, the reassembly by uh, putting a little bit of oil on the shock settings. Now, I actually did cut my nose hair, but uh, not enough, it seems. Grows like crazy, man. Must be those Norwegian troll genes. Let's get the shock settings back into uh, the balance and uh, see if it oscillates uh, okay.
and that looks uh, pretty okay actually. We're still not out of the woods. We need to make sure that uh, the balance is in beat, but let's get back to that later. Let's uh, keep uh, reassembling uh, the movement. We're going to use some uh, grease at the bottom of the barrel. Just uh, three tiny little uh, dots. The reason we're putting grease in is that uh, we are reusing uh, the mainspring. New mainsprings uh, come lubricated, so you don't have to uh, lubricate uh, the barrel then. You could also lubricate uh, the mainspring directly. This method works as well. The mainspring winder is an uh, essential tool if you're doing a lot of uh, work on old watches. And with the mainspring inside the tool, we can then uh, put it into the holder and plunge it into the barrel. So I actually uh, spent a couple of weeks in the was step in uh, September. For those who don't uh, know it, uh, Wastep is uh, originally one school founded by the big brands and still uh, funded by the big brands. Uh, has since branched out to uh, quite a few countries around the world. Wastep uh, is an abbreviation for uh, Watchmakers of Switzerland Training and Education Program. So, mouthful. It's a really good school and I was uh, very pleasantly surprised by uh, the extremely friendly atmosphere and very down to earth, uh, no nonsense, no arrogance, no nothing, just very friendly people and knowledgeable people all around. Of course it does uh, make me uh, wish I started this whole uh, watchmaking thing earlier than I did. But uh, one of the good things uh, nowadays is that we live long enough to actually do several things in our lives. So for those of you out there who's uh, watching this and thinking uh, they're too old to pick up uh, watchmaking or start doing this kind of thing as a hobby, you're not. Think about it. As a watchmaker, you get to wear basically glasses or a loop all the time. So it's perfect for old people. Look at these shaky hands. Yeah. So if you do want to uh, dip your toes in the watchmaking water, then uh, go ahead. It's uh, great fun and very satisfying, of course, to uh, work on uh, watches that have a problem and uh, if you're able to uh, solve them. But as I uh, talked a little bit about in uh, the previous video, do not start working on watches with uh, problems. Start working on watches that actually work. That way you know that if they don't work after you worked on them, the reason is you. The reason is you. But by all means, uh, there are so many resources out there nowadays that it's uh, really not uh, as big of a hurdle anymore to, uh, to learn a little bit about this. And uh, as I said before, it is mechanics. It is metal. It is uh, steel and well, brass may be a little bit less cool than steel, but a lot of steel. Well, actually more brass, but don't tell anyone. Anyway, we are uh, over on the dial side, putting uh, the keyless works back together. Pretty straightforward keyless works on this watch. Whenever you have an old movement like this with a setting lever screw, that can be a little bit tricky to uh, get that one in and even more tricky to uh, get it on the camera. 
We're putting a little bit of uh, thick oil on the different posts. And then we can put in uh, the cannon pinion wheel. Hey, it's upside down, man. Aha. Uh -huh. Actually, it does make it easier to oil if you put it upside down like this. Because uh, the cannon pinion is friction fit onto the wheel. So we need to make sure that uh, it can rotate relatively freely. Shouldn't rotate uh, just by looking at it, but uh, should also not be very tight. Basically, freer than you might think. Where we have the strongest friction, we're going to use this uh, 9504 grease. And no, we don't want to use that much. We basically shouldn't be able to see the lubrication, so we're going to remove uh, the excess with some uh, Swiss Play-Doh. And then we can put on uh, the setting lever and spring, slash cover. For those who are a bit curious about uh, how these different parts actually fit together and work together, you can watch a video uh, that I linked to up in the corner here. The good thing about mechanical watches is that uh, everything that happens or doesn't happen has a very logic reason. So it should always be possible to find out what's wrong and uh, hopefully also uh, rectify it. That might mean uh, replacing parts, it might mean uh, reshaping parts or polishing parts like pivots, that kind of thing. But four watches made a uh, long time ago, like the 50s, 60s and so forth, they were made with the best materials. So uh, they'll often show very limited wear, especially compared to uh, newer watches, which are made to a completely different business model. Anyway, we're back over on uh, the train side. We're going to put this uh, lovely little click and the spring underneath uh, the ratchet wheel. And tightening uh, the screw, we should also see uh, the train run. That looks uh, all right. Now with the crown wheel in place, if we wind the watch just past one of the clicks, we should see the whole train recoil a little bit. And that's because the click will push the ratchet wheel back in the opposite direction. If you don't see it recoil, then uh, the train is not running entirely freely. So that's a nice little test to do as well. Let's get uh, the pallet fork in place and lubricate it. This is a low beat movement, so we can use uh, oil on the exit pallet stone if we uh, want to. We could use uh, grease as well, but uh, oil is fine with these old uh, movements. The uh, escape wheel, which is uh, the wheel rotating on top of uh, the frame here, has uh, 15 teeth. So if we put one drop on uh, the exit pallet and then rotate uh, the escape wheel or let it uh, escape five teeth at a time, we can do that three times. Wonderful how math works. All right, then we can put uh, the balance back in.
and see if we can uh, get this uh, watch running. Or maybe limping. So we see it does uh, run, but it was uh, quite reluctant to uh, really start. We're gonna oil the pivots. We use uh, 9010 for uh, most of the pivots, but uh, HP 1300 for, uh, let's say, the slowly rotating wheels. So for this one, that would uh, mainly be the second wheel. And let's then see what the time grapher says. Well, roughly translated, the time grapher says, get out of here. So we see the two lines are uh, pretty parallel, so that's a good thing. Obviously the amplitude is way too low and the beat there is way too high. So we're going to have to do something about that. The critical thing is a beat error. This is why the watch wouldn't start by itself and uh, it will not have good amplitude either. The beat error tells us that the left turn and the right turn of the balance are not the same length. And to find out uh, which one it is, left or right, we can uh, let the power down and uh, see where the balance stops. Now when we say the balance, what we actually mean is the impulse pin on the uh, roller on the underside of the balance. The roller is friction fit onto the balance staff, so in theory the impulse pin could be anywhere. But in a balance with two spokes like this one, it's a general practice to make it perpendicular to the spokes of the balance arm. It should, however, point directly to the center of the escape wheel. So in this balance, it's pretty far off. In modern movements, uh, you can normally just move the stud of the hairspring, and that effectively rotates uh, the balance and thus with it uh, the impulse pin. But in the old movements like this one, we have to manually move the collet of the hairspring. And this uh, is a little bit uh, tricky and uh, somewhat dangerous. You really don't want to slip when you're doing this. That can damage the hairspring. And no, I didn't get it right the first time. I had to try quite a few times actually. But uh, eventually we got uh, the beat error down to less than one millisecond. And as we can see, uh, with it comes uh, the amplitude. So that's uh, acceptable. We'll be happy with that, especially given the state this hairspring was in. All right, with that we can uh, put on uh, the hour wheel and the dial. Given that there's no date on this watch, uh, we can put the hour hand uh, wherever we want. Well, as long as it's uh, at the center of the dial, that is. And we're going to check uh, that uh, the uh, hour hand is parallel to the dial. And when we then turn it to uh, a full hour, it doesn't have to be 12 o'clock, it can be whatever full hour. Then of course we know that uh, the long hand should point up. Or to 12 o'clock if you will. Not that all watches have 12 o'clock up, but uh, most do. Again, we're going to check uh, that the minute hand is parallel to the dial and uh, that's also parallel to uh, the hour hand. That they're not touching each other over the dial. <coughs> and finally the seconds hand and same procedure. Alright, with all the hands in place, 
let's then uh, turn to casing the movement. Remember that the crystal was uh, somewhat scratched, so we're going to put in a new one. Shiny. We use our crystal press. We want to make sure that uh, the case is uh, stable. And we want to make sure that we find uh, a die that is uh, a little bit bigger than the crystal, so that we can uh, press it in ever so slightly. When I'm saying that the case is stable, we basically want it to uh, self-center. So that when we press down, we know we're pressing everything towards the center of the case. And we can see right now it wasn't very centered. So uh, once we're getting close to the case, we want to make sure we uh, have everything lined up. And then we can gently press the crystal down into the case. A little bit of dust on it, otherwise fine. Gonna make sure we don't have any dust or debris on the inside of the crystal. Doesn't really matter on the outside for now. And then we can place uh, the movement into the case. A little bit unusual uh, this movement in uh, that you have this uh, spacer ring that is uh, held in place by these two uh, clamps which actually have to be placed and then slid back into uh, the cutout in uh, the case. But again, everything in the watch is logical. As long as we don't use force on things, we should be able to figure it out. Last thing before we can put a strap on the watch and seat on the wrist is to put in a new gasket. We basically rub the gasket in silicone. It makes it a little bit more supple. So that it also then tightens the case better. Before seeing the watch on the wrist, I'd just like to remind everyone that if you're looking for a beautiful vintage watch with a 12-month warranty and fully serviced, check out vintagewatchservices.eu. YouTube subscribers get 10% off, so just ask for a coupon for that. All right, there we have it. A simple watch with a very complicated uh, problem. But it's a beautiful old dress watch. With a little bit of uh, buffing, that uh, case looks uh, nice and shiny as well. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then uh, clicking like and subscribe will really help the channel. We'll be back uh, with another video shortly. Until then. Ta-ta. <laughs>